don't do that. Think that's cool? 40 acres in a mule. Fat Nellyville, 40 acres in a pool. Brother to the bitch, when they came home, we was rich. But for the acres and a the mule, they got 50 rats in a brand new city. Black Americans getting 40 acres and a mule after elections. We've all heard the phrase, but what if we told you that the 40 acres and a mule order could be used today? Here is something Trump said the other day them to do whatever the hell they want. You gotta pay. You gotta pay your bills. Well, what about the bills America owes to black people? Black families have had their land stolen through these taxes and racist domain policies, but no other government promise has had a more devastating effect than the 40 acres and the mule. As the Civil War was coming to an end in 1865, the U.S. government promised recently free black folks that they could turn their life around they would get 40 acres and a mule. They could have used this land to feed their families, work on it, and pass it on from generation to generation. The products they would have sold from it could help educate their children and create generational wealth. But then, black people were faced with a harsh reality. The 40 acre policy would never see the light of day. There was no way on earth that slave owners and pro-union Southerners would let something so radical change the face of America forever. So they got rid of the threat. They assassinated Lincoln and created a hell on earth for the black community. Why? Well, if the policy grew roots, it would have ignited a fire across all of U.S. soil, putting black people at the forefront of the economy. It's simple, really. Ever heard the saying, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day? teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. Yeah, well, if people got the land they were owed, they could have become self-sufficient. Self-sufficiency is dangerous, but it was more than that. Black people were tired of the way white folks treated them. So they wanted to create a state of only blacks, governed by blacks and farmed by blacks. Who do you think was the best farmer, worker and builder? Black people, of course. They never had the chance to live a normal life except to work day and night. Their skills were impeccable. Work to survive, survive to work over and over again. So when I was a little girl in, in slave days, I always had something to do every day, every day. If blacks were allowed to create what effectively would be an ethno state, they would have gained the upper hand in terms of economy. Of course, the white supremacists wouldn't let that happen. But what if we told you that this exact order would be worth at least $6.4 trillion today? Slavery made America wealthy, and racist policies have been blocking black people from building wealth for years. Its impact can still be felt today. Farmers and other black landowners have repeatedly been targeted to have their property taken. Do you think that you would have been that much further ahead? if you were one of your white counterparts? Oh yes, we, we would not have lost the land. We would have gotten the loans and the services that all farmers should get through the government. The question is, how would these reparations look now? People can't just seize land without compensation. This is not the reconstruction period. The 40 acres and a mule promised black people that the Georgian coast and South Carolina would be left to them. Basically a huge chunk of the South included the land that stretched from Charleston to the St. John's River in Florida. The area was so massive that it would have had a detrimental impact on American families. There is no way to get that land back, even if it used to belong to black people. Does that mean reparations should be done via bond investments of their current values and then divide them between the descendants of slaves? Some people want land, others want money. But black families have been denied justice so many times because the laws were set against them. How would we solve the racial wealth gap and the damage it has done? Based on recent statistics, almost six in 10 black adults say their ancestors were enslaved. That is 57% of the population. Roughly four in 10 said their ancestors were enslaved in the United States. When black people fought and bled for their freedom, a lot of white people who lived in rural areas hated the way the Union waged war in the South. There was death on all sides. The common people suffered the most because of politics. Politics is poisonous. 
It creates a vicious cycle of hatred, anger, and resentment. It divides people. It makes them bitter and cynical. Wealthy white planters were able to redirect that hatred toward black people with the help of the Ku Klux Klan. So even if slavery was officially abolished, the South was still going to be a hostile and dangerous environment for every single black person who lived there. The 40 acres and a mule was going to change everything. Here is what historian Eric Foner wrote about in his book, Reconstruction, America's Unfinished Revolution. Here in coastal South Carolina and Georgia, the prospect beckoned of a transformation of Southern society more radical even than the end of slavery. Can you imagine how different our lives would have been if this promise actually came true? There would be no racial wealth gap and the structure of the black family would have come out stronger than ever. First of all, this nation was built on the backs of black families. It all started with more than two centuries of legal slavery, which had a ripple effect years after that. It stripped black people of their wealth, liberty, and basic human rights. It was slavery that created modern day capitalism and made the United States one of the wealthiest countries. At the time of the Civil War, about 4 million black people were still enslaved. That was about 13% of the total American population. The demand for cotton was massive. Cotton production in the U.S. went up from just a couple of thousand tons at the turn of the 19th century to well over 1.6 million and 4.3 million tons through most of the 20th century. The rich industrialists saw the perfect opportunity to profit off poor rural blacks. Black folks were fed up with the inner workings of the slave society. They wanted to build a new place for themselves and their families. They wanted to actively confront racial prejudice as well as social, political, and economic challenges for the years to come. In other words, they knew that emancipation wouldn't give formerly enslaved people any real economic freedom. It would just keep them stuck in a broken system, a system that will do whatever it takes to keep black folks at the bottom of society. They needed something else something that had the power to shake the entire nation to its core if it ever came to be. On January 12th, 1865, black leaders had a meeting at the Green Meldron House with other military officials. They said that white people were impossible to live with. Black families were afraid that it would take years for society to get rid of their racial prejudice and provide a comfortable place for black folks to live in. What do you want for your people? This is what William T. Sherman asked the 20 pastors who came to the mansion. This has never happened before. It was the very first time government officials had asked black people what they wanted for their future and the future of their families. Rather than live among white folks, black people wanted to have their own land. This meant it was time to redistribute the land of rich plantation owners in the South. Here is what Reverend Garrison Frazier said. He was a spokesman and Baptist minister for the group. The way we can best take care of ourselves is to have land and turn it and till it by our own labor. We want to be placed on land until we are able to buy it and make it our own. Just a couple of days later, on January 16th, 1865, Sherman gave a special field order 15 that stated 400,000 acres of property to be confiscated from Confederate landowners and be given to black Americans. Mules were not part of the order. However, the Union Army provided some as part of the effort. Now, let's make this clear. Sherman was not an abolitionist. The idea to redistribute the land came from Edwin M. Stanton. He was a secretary of war at the time. Today, we call it the 40 acres and a mule. But have you read the order itself? That's where things get interesting. Section one says, the islands near Charleston, abandoned rice fields by the rivers and land along the St. John's River in Florida are set aside and reserved for black Americans who have been free because of the war and the president's proclamation. Section two says the people who will settle the land can make their own communities. Black people would govern these communities. Here is an excerpt from the order itself. On the islands and in the settlements hereafter to be established, no white person whatsoever, unless military officers and soldiers detailed for duty, will be permitted to reside, and the sole and exclusive management of affairs will be left to the free people themselves. By the laws of war and orders of the President of the United States, the Negro is free and must be dealt with as such. 
Section 3 gives us even more details. Each black family will get their own land, not more than 40 acres that they can cultivate. If the land is next to a water channel, they can have up to 800 feet of waterfront. The military will make sure they are safe until there comes a time when these people can do it on their own or Congress officially settles their ownership rights. Nothing was in the order about people getting a mule with the land. However, some families did receive mules from the army because the army had excess mules that were left from the war. Not only would this order give black people a better life, but it would also break the power dynamic that slaveholders in the South held. The power that shaped the country and the way society viewed black people. Everything was going according to plan. The Union generals divided plantations into smaller settlements so black Americans could make use of them. Those who settled there started working on their land right away. About 1,000 people settled on Georgia's Skidaway Island. By June, 40,000 out of 4 million freed slaves received their end of the bargain. But well, you guessed it, the public was furious. They literally lost it. Confederate sympathizers and rich Southerners believed that General Sherman was out of line. The land that he promised to the black people was not his to give. It still belonged to the plantation owners, so it had to be revoked. If the government wouldn't do it the easy way, they would do it the hard way. That's exactly what happened. Lincoln was assassinated on April 15, 1865. President Andrew Johnson revoked the field order and the promise was broken. Confederate owners got their land back, but they also got hungrier and thirsty for revenge. They wanted to make sure that black Americans would never put them in the same situation again. From 1887 to 1892, nine states enforced laws that would segregate America. It was the start of the Jim Crow era. A farmer without a market to sell to will never become economically independent. They would need to work more and for less money. Why else do you think the white slave owners would try so hard to terrorize former slaves and deny them the right to own land even long after the war ended? Because once you make a black person dependent on the system, you can exploit them in every industry, whether that meant in the iron plants, cotton plantations, carpentry, or anywhere else. The Reconstruction period was so bad, it set formerly enslaved black people back at least 150 years. No policy, no laws, and no government efforts have been more damaging to black people than the Jim Crow era. It tore black families apart. The black people who lived and worked in the cotton fields were abused in every way you can imagine. To make matters worse, those who lived in the 1900s were seriously affected by a beetle called boll weevil. It brought the cotton industry to the brink of destruction. For years after that, even today, black people would fight to get their land back. So what happened to all free black people after the Civil War? Well, they still had to support themselves. So in many cases, they ended up working for the same families that enslaved them in the first place. The crops needed tending, work had to be done, and money had to be made to survive. But what the Civil War changed was that it created a new chance for mobility. If the former master was evil and cruel or didn't want to pay, black folks now had the opportunity to move to a different farm and try to find work there. The best boss, wage, or working conditions didn't exist. Racism and local corruption were widespread. Still, black folks could move on to another town. Other than farming, black people could find work in different industries depending on the location. Florida, for example, was great for the timber industry. Major exports from the first railroads came from there. Factories needed skilled personnel and coastal cities needed dock workers. There were factories all across the South and the North. From the 1910s until the 1970s, many black folks moved to the North. They wanted to get better jobs and live better lives. The North, in that sense, gave them some comfort. It wasn't paradise, but it was much better than the South. With the Industrial Revolution, people were also eager to learn. Education gave them hope for the future and the possibility of better income. It allowed them to gain political power. It helped them to think for themselves and establish their own institutions. But the boot of oppression was so strong that it took decades for black folks to get treated like normal people instead of being seen as second-class citizens. White racists burned down their schools and tormented and vandalized their homes. Lynchings were common. 
Beatings were common. Every possible horror you can imagine was common. The KKK would just come up to your house and set it on fire and kill people in the middle of the square because there were no consequences. This kind of ideology made it incredibly difficult, almost impossible, for black people to own land. And despite all of that, black folks still didn't back down. Oh no, they came back stronger than ever. Records from 1910 show that more black Americans became landowners in the history of the U.S. About 210,000 black people owned more than 14 million acres of land. The peak of black farmland ownership happened in 1910 when black folks owned 16 to 19 million acres of land. But this figure has gone down to less than 3 million acres today. In fact, black farmers make up little over 1% of all U.S. farmers. So what the hell happened? Here is how the Federation of Southern Cooperatives explains the whole thing. The causes of underutilization and loss of rural black land are numerous and complex, but none is more notable than heirs' property. The United States Department of Agriculture called the heirs' property the number one cause of black involuntary land loss. Heirs' property is formed when the person who owns the land dies without a will or any type of estate planning. The will, as you already know, is made while the owner is still alive. The thing is, most, if not all, first generation black landowners couldn't get proper legal help. They just got the chance to buy their own land, so they had no idea how to deal with actual legal disputes. When there is no will, the land gets passed down to the heirs. Over the years, it becomes more and more difficult to prove who really owns the property, especially when the name of the original owner is still on that paper and that person is long gone. To resolve the ownership issue, black people had to pay thousands of dollars and waste years of their lives. They had to track down their family tree, do land surveys, and find many other documents. To get over this, they had to hire a lawyer. If they were lucky enough to get a good lawyer who would defend a black man or a woman, they still had to spend an absurd amount of money. It was a kind of money that people didn't have. Not to even mention, it was hard to find lawyers who specialized in property cases. That's where the Federation of Southern Cooperatives came into play. Sometimes a piece of land can end up with a bunch of owners. And as time goes on, this number increases. Because every owner has a share of the land, it's hard to get everyone to agree on what to do with the land. For example, some people like to sell it and move elsewhere. They hate living in the South and want to move up North, but they need the money to do so. Others want to keep it so they can work on it. Their fathers worked so hard to get the land, so there was no way they would sell it. In many cases, heirs don't want to divide the land. Dividing it would earn them no real value and offer little space for farming. But developers saw something else. They saw an opportunity. What do you think happens when you make a deal with someone who knows the law a million times better than you do? These developers would find loopholes and exploit every possible situation. That is what happened to the black community. Developers purchased the interest of one heir and would then force land sales in court. To decrease this kind of exploitation, 18 states passed the Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act, but it was already too late. When heirs property owners wanted to farm the land, they faced serious obstacles time and time again. Black families were excluded from USDA programs because of racism. The system was just built that way. At the very same time that America refused to give the Negro any land, through an act of Congress, our government was giving away millions of acres of land. If you needed to get help from the USDA, you needed something called a farm number. Now, for this farm number, you had to have control of land or proof of ownership. These were two things that black people usually didn't have. So black families lost much of what they'd earned and were once again back to square one. Just think about it. Why is it that every time black people succeed in something, they have to take 10 steps backward? That initial meeting at the Green Meldrum House 
completely changed how white people saw black leaders. It was obvious that these black folks posed a threat. They were intelligent, articulate, calculating, and able to change society in a way white supremacists never thought possible. If they could create such a radical public policy initiative, what would they do next? The interesting thing is a lot of what the civil rights movement has been fighting for has paid off. The Federation of Southern Cooperatives worked hard to fix the problems that came from Ayers' property. More than a century and a half later, on December 20th, the 2018 Farm Bill was passed. This bill allowed Americans with authorized alternative documents to get a farm number. This would help them qualify for USDA assistance programs. It was designed to help families build wealth over time. But there is more. On June 19th, 2019, a historic hearing took place in honor of the 40 acres and a mule. I, I want to be clear. It's not just about a check. Correct. When I think of, um, I think of about some African-American women who are languishing in nursing homes with no money, no wealth. No, no let's cut a check. The hearing on H.R. 40 would create the foundation for a commission dedicated to studying the concepts of reparations for black people in America during the time of slavery and the Jim Crow era. The U.S. government also issued a formal apology, which is something people have been looking forward to for a very long time. Two years later, in July 2021, USDA declared that the Heirs Property Relending Program would offer $67 million for loans. The loans would come in handy for those who couldn't afford their succession plans or consolidation of property interests. The goal is simple. Fix land problems that have kept some landowners and producers from being able to make full use of the USDA benefits. This is a step in the right direction, but a long way from getting black people out of poverty. The racial wealth gap is still going strong. Of course, millions of black Americans have not received any form of reparations for the land they've lost. The question is, what would the 40 acres of land in a mule be worth in today's money? Let's talk about it with 21st century logic. Many people don't want mules, but just for the fun of it, if you Google the price of a mule, the average cost is about $9,000. It can go up to 60,000 depending on the breed. Some can cost a lot more than that. Land is a different story. 40 acres of land can be worth millions. Land prices in the South are very high in certain parts of Florida, like Miami or Orlando. Popular urban centers like Texas and Austin have higher prices per acre because of the high demand and limited available space. Coastal areas are another story. They are a popular tourist attraction that can help you earn millions based on the amount of land you are trying to sell. Of course, not all plots of land are worth the same. 40 acres of land in remote Alaska, for example, won't be worth that much. Alaska is hard to cultivate. What can be farmed depends on where you live. Natural resources have a lot more value. So how can the government reconcile the disparities when it comes to land value? It would make more sense if the reparations were put into things that are more achievable in today's economic climate, things that people could use right now. This can come in the form of housing, employment, and education. Health and wellness programs would be a huge plus. Now we see a lot of black neighborhoods that continue to struggle. Poverty is a significant issue, which is why many believe that black people should still be paid even if what happened was years ago. Ukraine got $113 billion and they are in a different country. That money, for example, could be used to ensure that schools in every district are equally funded. I tell you, when I walk down this, I feel like I'm in a prison. I know, right? Doesn't it? Why would your kids want to come here? when it looks like you're in a prison. Everywhere around the country, you can see school districts where black students of poor income households go that are facing serious funding gaps. According to recent statistics, most non-white districts are getting $23 billion less in funding annually than most white districts. It's no wonder why children don't want to learn in these schools. Reparations can come in different forms that can benefit not just black people, but Americans as a whole, regardless of race or color. For example, creating AI and robotics training centers where people could learn how to deal with the upcoming job crisis that the rise of artificial intelligence is going to create. 
Now, a lot of people will argue about this idea. They would say what is done is done. We can't fix the past, but we can look forward to the future. And there is some truth in that. It's not easy to get reparations for anything. That's because every enslaver and every enslaved person is long dead. It's not easy to get reparations for anything. That's because every enslaver and every enslaved person is long dead. The people alive today don't owe anything to society because of what their ancestors did. It would be unconstitutional to punish all white people for the sins of those who died 100 or 200 years ago. They would say the hard times have come to an end and that we need to move on. But that doesn't mean that the blood spilled would go unnoticed. We are talking about millions of black Americans who've had everything stolen from them. What do you guys think? Does every single black American deserve reparation? What would the perfect case scenario look like? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you for watching.